Um, so I think it's time to, to start with the introduction. So thank you very much for uh, uh, attending this uh, uh, online seminar of Professor uh, uh, Bazant. So I'm really happy uh, to have the opportunity as a chair of the um, Canadian Committee of Mechanics for IUTAM to be the organizer of uh, this seminar. This seminar is co-organized by um, uh, Memo Center in uh, Italy and uh, uh, has been joined in the organization by a few Italian universities that they made the seminar official for their PhD schools. Uh, one of them is the University of Parma, then there is uh, L'Aquila and Roma and uh, several other uh, uh, universities. So, um, the uh, speaker of uh, um, uh, this special, very special uh, uh, seminar is uh, um, actually Professor uh, uh, Zedek Bazant from uh, uh, Evanston. He's uh, a uh, really uh, huge authority in mechanics to the point that uh, a Stanford study of 2019 uh, indicated him as uh, um, the second most highly cited uh, person in all the field of engineering and obviously was the first in mechanics and the most recent version of this study indicated him, uh, confirmed him in, in that position. So just to uh, make it short, I want to uh, read a few of uh, the um, uh, achievement of Professor Bazant. Um, by the way, I see Bernard Schreffler on, uh, uh, is connected. Uh, Julio, if you can make him panelist because he's asking me, he want to ask a question online. Uh, um, so the number of academies that Professor Bazant is a fellow of member is outstanding is in the National Academy of Engineering in US, is in the National Academy of Sciences in US, one of the few in mechanics, is a member of the American Academy of Art and Sciences. These are just US. Then the Royal Society of London, is uh, one of the most prestigious academies on, uh, in the world. National Academy of Austria, Czech Republic, uh, is foreign member of Lince Academy in Italy, uh, and then Spain, uh, Academia Europea, European Academy of Art, Sciences, uh, Arts and, uh, Sciences and Arts, etc., etc. About uh, the uh, awards that he received, I want just to say a few of them. Um, starting from uh, uh, mechanical engineering, I would say the ASME medal, the Timoshenko medal, the Worcester Warner Re Me Reed medal, etc. And then from the American Society of Civil Engineering, basically all uh, the most prestigious award, including uh, the von Karman medal, the Mindlin medal, the Bio medal, Fraudenthal medal, etc. etc. He received also from many other society, including the Society of Engineering Sciences, the Prager Medal. So we are talking about uh, one of the most distinguished, if not the most distinguished person in mechanics that we have right now. So I'm very happy to give uh, uh, the um, uh, words to, uh, I mean, the possibility to say a few words to Francesco dell'Isola, who uh, is organizing with me a conference next year in Sardinia, and Professor Bazant will give a plenary lecture there, so we would like also to invite you to, to come if you have any interest to meet Professor Bazant in person instead only in video like today. Uh, please, Francesco. I simply will tell to everybody, thank, thanks for uh, coming to this webinar. I thank Professor Bazan for having accepted two invitations from us for this uh, seminar here and for the plenary lecture in Sardinia. And let us cross the fingers that we will manage 
to be there next year and this storm, these epidemics will be ended. I think it is better if we start hearing uh, the lecture as soon as possible, so please. Okay, so just a uh, um, couple of words. Uh, uh, Professor Vestroni is there and uh, he made the, the seminar official for uh, uh, Roma School. Please, uh, Fabrizio. Thanks, Marco. Just, just a very special greeting to Professor Bajan um, from Rome, from many Italian colleagues. And uh, in, this, uh, in this very um, terrible times, uh, it, is a, it is really a great pleasure to, to attend a conference uh, very far from us across the ocean, a conference uh, by Professor Bajan, a distinguished researcher that uh, gave us an incredible number of fundamental contributions. Thanks, uh, thanks very much to Marco Mabili and Francesco Di Lissima for having organized this seminar. Thanks. Grazie. Thank you. Uh, Gianni, please, uh, a few words, because uh, this is an official seminar for Parma. Yes, I'd like to thank you very much, Professor Bajan. It is a real honor for us. I am the Director of Graduate Studies in uh, Mechanical Engineering at the in our PhD program um, at the University of Parma. A few students of us uh, are attending this seminar. And uh, I thank you and I thank the organizer, in particular Marco, for having given us this unique opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gianni. Um, Bernard, do you want to say a few words and uh, after we start and then everybody who is panelist will be able to ask questions in person or whatever to Professor Bazan. Yeah, I'm glad that I can participate. I'm very interested to hear what uh, Zdenek has to see, to say about these problems because we are still quite active in research in fracturing too. So thank you very much. Now it's time for Professor Bazan to give us the seminar and then everyone who is connected with the video will be able to ask questions in person and all the other attendees, please send uh, with, uh, you know, you can type the questions and we will ask your question to Professor Bazan, please. Okay. So, Let me share the screen and get rid of this bar, my floating panel, and uh, let me enlarge it. Uh, there is the icon here. Okay, so good morning uh, or good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank you, Marco, uh, and your Italian colleagues uh, for your splendid, I would say, too kind and over generous introduction. It's very nice. I deeply, deeply appreciate the privilege of this invitation uh, by the Canadian National Committee of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics, uh, endorsed by UTAM and co-sponsored by Italian Center for Mathematics and Mechanics of Complex Systems. I have been very fortunate uh, with a number of outstanding collaborators and I will introduce them at the end. This invitation gives me a precious opportunity to present some new results which are in Northwestern quite excited about and deal with the consequences of the recently conceived gap test, uh, which is uh, a test which overcomes some, in a very simple way, uh, some limitations of the standard fracture specimens, uh, which uh, are dis distinguished one characteristics. They have a negligible or zero stress parallel to the cracks in all these specimens. Is, uh, negligible normal stress. Now, if we think that fracture is a line 
Of course, we don't need this. This could have no effect. But fracture front is not a line. For example, we know since Griffith's time that fracture energy is orders of magnitude larger than surface energy of the solid. So that's one indication. Uh, the only case we could speak of a line in theory is uh, by the cohesion of interatomic forces in a crack like this, that's theoretical, but always even in materials which have micrometer and sub micrometer process zone, there is a finite width, which it was. Micro cracks, micro slips, voids, and so forth. And uh, that has an effect that means that uh, models such as cohesive crack model, or of course, LEFM, linear elastic fracture mechanics, don't take, uh, cannot be taken into account. Now, in general, uh, we can have stresses which are parallel in the direction of the propagation, which are parallel in the, to the plane in the transverse direction, and also shear stresses. This uh, normal stress in the direction is called often T stress. The other ones I better is the, you know, by the uh, uh, subscripts. All right, so we speak of fracture mechanics, which is now 100 years old. And uh, later addition in 1950s was ductile fracture mechanics, much more recently quasi-bital fracture mechanics, and I speak of these two only. Now, in uh, uh, ductile fracture mechanics, we have a large yielding zone and then a fracture process zone, which is order of molecules smaller in metals. Uh, on the other hand, in quasi-bital fracture mechanics, we have a large fracture process zone in concrete about one foot long or more. And then no yielding zone, immediately linear elastic unloading around it. So in the first part of this talk, I will talk about gap, gap test consequences for quasi-bital fracture. I will to some extent review what I spoke in a webinar last June. Uh, and then I take on the metals. So quasi-bital materials are materials with brittle constituents, no plasticity, and non-negligible inhomogeneity size. Are typically concrete where things are easiest detected uh, in the lab, and that's where it started actually in the 70s. Our studies, but there are tough ceramics, fiber composite, rocks, bones, sea ice, whole range of materials, and actually all brittle materials on micro and nano scales, including polysilicon, but become quasi brittle. And they are distinguished by size effects, scaling, and uh, behavioral changes from uh, ductile to brittle when you increase the size. But this is not plasticity, that's uh, damage plateau. Uh, so uh, cause arbitralism uh, is, must be pointed out as a relative concept, relative to the application size. So in concrete, as I said, half a meter is the process zone. In Arctic Ocean, uh, crack overall, which uh, were studied by US Navy, uh, the particles are the flows, which are several miles in size, so fracture process zone is about 10 kilometers. If you go to MEMS, polysilicon metals, it's of the order of microns. Now the gap test. Now the, many people think of course of these stresses before, but the advantage here is that it is simple, it's unambiguous for interpretation in terms of parallel stress. So let me show the picture. So we have a standard three-point bent fracture specimen, but we put the supports with a gap. And in near the crack mass, we put plastic pads, which have the property that uh, they go to the plastic, nearly perfect plasticity. So we load the specimen first, and what we produce is a compression parallel to the crack. Eventually it goes plastic, and once it goes plastic, we time the gap so that it would close at that time. And then you introduce bending, which means mode one loading here, but this force remains constant. So it is just like applied load. So the system is static determinant at first, it's against static determinant, which makes easy evaluation. All right, let, let me show 
more instrument, instrumentation. So we run the specimen. Uh, actually, we need only the peak load, but to avoid uh, random uh, jumps, uh, we put uh, to minimize them. We put extensometer at the crack mouth, a uh, crack tip, crack tip gauge. Then running the test, and let me show the pads. The low deflection diagram with these, with these polyethylene pads uh, is uh, shows like this elastic. And then it becomes almost horizontal. And what is important is that during the rise of the bending moment, uh, uh, this is this distance, the change of load is only 0.4%. So it's insignificant compared to other errors that exist. We have done the tests uh, first on concrete and also metals. So uh, we started less than a year ago, actually. Uh, so we have the specimen here with the crack tip gauge. Uh, uh, the gap is visible here at the ends. Uh, so there's a setup. And the low deflection diagram on the on um, on the uh, on the lo loading pad uh, on the loading uh, on top is like this. Okay, it's always seating. Uh, of the, uh, then the pads deflect elastically, then we go to plastic, and then we introduce the bending moment, gap closes, there is a rise of the load, and uh, on the actuate, uh, on the stroke actually appears steep descent, but uh, if we, we control it by the crack, crack tip gauge, and then there is a very gradual softening afterwards, but we don't need that, we need only the maximum load, so it can, we don't even, we don't even need a stiff machine for that. Uh, now, what is important that uh, in this test we introduce a field of compression which is almost uniform. So these are the loads from the pads and the principal stress vectors you see are equally spaced and equally long. So the, we have a virtually uniform compressive stress field, slightly different from uh, the applied load, but uniform. Then when the gap closes, we superimpose uh, transverse uh, stresses, uh, mode one loading, and this is manifested here. Now, what is the motto of our approach? Uh, how should we determine the fracture energy, GF? By scaling. Epitomizing fluid mechanics for decades, I've adhered to the motto that the scaling of response is a key characteristic of every physical system. It is often from scaling that the system properties are identified the easiest. Uh, this is well known in fluid mechanics, but has been not, not pursued this line of thinking in fluid mechanics until 19, uh, 1970s uh, at all. So we uh, developed the spec uh, we built specimen of three sizes, geometrically similar with similar gaps, in this case, one to two to four. Uh, actually, uh, these are the actual depths in inches for concrete in this case. Similar, uh, including the initial notches, uh, similar pads, everything. And then we apply the load and uh, compare the different sizes. Now, the key is that we have a simple law, which is surprisingly accurate actually. It is a size effect law, which was proposed in 1984 by simplistic uh, energetic arguments, but then proven very rigorously in subsequent studies, especially 2004. The key is that this is an asymptotic matching formula. Namely, for we can establish rigorously the asymptotic expansion uh, for a quasi specimen with process on a specimen going to zero size, that means theoretically under the size of the, uh, uh, of the fracture process zone, it can be shown the nominal strengths. Now that we use as a parameter of dimension of stress uh, and a parameter of load. So it is load divided by homologous cross-section area, for example, thickness and size D. So this approach is linear in the second term, constant minus linear. And in log scale, it of course looks as an exponential here. For large size, it can be shown that the expansion is this. There is expansion of LEFM actually, 
1 over the square root of size, and then the second term is d, 1 over d. Now, the asymptotic terms give you curves like the dashed curves. And the asymptotic matching provides a formula which follows it to the second order and then connects throughout. So uh, uh, it, it uh, happens to give surprisingly good result. This formula uh, is now embedded in ACI design code. All concrete structures have to use this size of a factor. Uh, uh, and it has become widely used. Now, the second point is that this formula can be connected to LEFM. And that's how to get the shape effects in. So by asymptotic expansion of LEFM that was done in 1990, 1990, we find that this formula can be rewritten in this form. So this G is energy least dimensionless, energy least function of LEFM. Uh, uh, so it's the non-dimensionalized uh, energy lease as a function of relative correct lengths, which is alpha, and initial one is the much is alpha zero. And G prime is its derivative. So that's available from Tada's handbook of all kinds of specimens, came with the final elements, and it's always available. And then if you do that, you can transform the formula to a linear regression plot, that's lucky. Uh, y is ax uh, plus c, and these constants, slope and intercept, are related to fracture energy. So the, the slope gives fracture energy. This is the linear regression. And uh, changing the slope means changing fracture energy, and the intercept then gives you the uh, size of the fracture process zone. Uh, these are some results for concrete, which is always scattered, but the means come always nicely on this curve. Uh, if you do more tests. Uh, and fraction energy change in this plot, log log scale, log log strength versus size, means shifting the asymptote left or right. That's the change of fraction energy. And the purpose of this formula is actually to get the asymptote, which gives the fraction energy. And uh, the rate of uh, approach uh, to this asymptote then gives you the process on size. All right. so. Why do we use this method and not, for example, the uh, older method of uh, work of fracture method for quasi-metal materials, which was uh, introduced by Herbert for concrete, work of fracture method. So uh, we need to, uh, we, uh, it became clear in the 1990s that in quasi-metal generally, you have a steep descent of the load in the fracture process zone versus crack opening. Uh, or widening of the process zone, and then a very long tail. And this side effect law gives you the area under the initial tangent, which is what matters generally for maximum loads. This enters for dynamics. Now the tail, uh, you don't get this way, but you need to know the ratio, and the ratio can be established either computationally by some additional testing. So we establish this, and we get the total fraction energy also. Uh, why we don't use this method introduced first by Nakayama for uh, fine grade ceramics for which it is uh, relatively okay for, for concrete wars and the reason is, is there is heterogeneity and the fracture process zone in concrete the effective size okay grows at first uh, in size then it propagates and then it decreases at the end of the ligament so behavior like this but you need to determine the average, the test gives the average of this because what we do is we measure energy dissipated by the load versus displacement of the whole specimen divided by ligament length uh, and, uh, and area and get fraction energy and that's not an accurate value. Besides, uh, it has been shown it has a strong size effect. The value which you get this way is not independent of size. So corrections are actually needed and also this tail is not exactly straight line. It's very hard to get to the end of the tail uh, and uh, there is much dissipation still there. So uh, this method we did not use, so we consider it less reliable, although it is uh, also a valid approach. Wait a minute. All right, now the test results uh, for mesoscale fracture specimens. 
So I plot here the fracture energy evaluated by side effect method relative to the value at no crack parallel stress, which is on the horizontal axis. It is plotted relatively uh, compared to compression strength, sigma C. So one means a compression failure in unixial compression. So we calibrate it by nine tests here, uh, side effect tests uh, as one. And then when we increase the compression, we get these results. That's based on nine tests now, uh, we're getting more. When we increase it still more, it goes down. And when we uh, have some 80% of the compression strength, uh, we are getting below the initial value and eventually probably going to zero. I show here also simulations by the microplane model, predictive, no, no parameters adjusted, except for matching this value, the strengths, the strengths, uh, matching the strengths, okay. And that gives the, uh, the following curve, the blue curve. Now, why there are two curves? The dashed curves gives the sigma measured, the stress measured on the pad, and there is a slight difference, uh, the correction which we have to make to get it in the near the crack tip, and that's exactly matched by calculations. Uh, this is a basic elastic field, and that shift is, uh, is there. All right, so these are the rata, and previously people were Suspecting there is an effect, of course, uh, it has been talked about, but uh, no clear data were available, but the simplicity of this distance allows it. Now it also gives us the fracture process zone size, width actually, and the width uh, increases from the intercept significantly. The width almost doubles by compression uh, in concrete. And uh, it doubles even more here, and then it goes steeply down and eventually becomes a line. Of course, it must, must go to zero, as it, what we see at the end. Again, small shift because of difference between pad and between the field and the crack tip. Now, you might say, all right, so why do we make a formula describing this curve, the blue curve I showed? The formula can be easily written here. Uh, can we use uh, LEFM? and put this formula in and then run XFEM and uh, some uh, code based on LEFM. Uh, uh, my answer is, or our conclusion is no, because the, uh, there is uh, path dependence. It is strong in plasticity. It is much stronger in damage. Damage is enormously path dependent. So gap test is shown here. We increase uh, normal compression stress. Then we increase the sigma n, which is uh, uh, mode one loading, increasing K1 or uh, fracture release, and we got here. If we do it proportionally, we get about 15% farther. This is the proportion test. If we do it first bending and then compression, we get here. So we get about 30% difference. But if we uh, start at not at 0.9 gap test, as I showed here, start at 0.4 which we have these tests also. So we first compression and then mode one test we get here. If we start first mode one and then try to do this, we can't because it fails here. And there is a difference as you see here, enormous difference. So uh, there is enormous path dependence here. So I don't think it will be very risky to use something like that. Some people tried uh, interesting idea to shrink tensorial uh, damage zone into a line which gives you uh, stress uh, displacement behavior, something like this. But that's, of course, is only for one mode of uh, one type of loading in certain proportion, not for others. Now, why we have this behavior? Uh, one has to look in the fracture process zone. So, in concrete, we have micro cracks and we have also micro slips. In fact, it has been shown in 1997 that uh, micro slips uh, dissipate about 70% of fracture energy in concrete, and only the rest is due to micro cracking. And micro slips uh, don't really uh, cause much, uh, much emissions, uh, sound emissions. So when we introduce compression, uh, friction on these inclined planes is uh, increased. 
uh, inhibited. But when the compression becomes large, then there is slip, and that slip causes expansion. This is the reason for increase of CF. So that's ex we get expansion. And then eventually, uh, after a lot of expansion, is actually splitting cracks, which means even more expansion of the process zone and uh, the widening. There's some, some speaking behind here. Okay. All right. So uh, can we model it uh, by models as their macroplane model? Well, uh, Drucker Prager or Mor Coulomb can capture. Uh, this is run on Abacus, uh, I1J2 criterion here, uh, Drucker Prager. It captures to some extent, but poorly, the uh, effect of the mild compression, but completely fails the large compression. The only model, I think, probably the best damaged plastic model, uh, tensorial in terms of invariance, is CDAPM2 by Grassel. I think originally with the RASEC, then it improved. Uh, so that model, first nothing, then it gives a big uh, strengthening. So, and then it's a softening here. So it's not, uh, it's less accurate than microplane model, which is here, but it gives a basic trend. Maybe it could be refined. And generally the tensor model with avians also can be seen give, uh, compared to microplane model and uh, other measurements give uh, incorrect actually, uh, uh, stress concentrations near the fatal zone. Uh, now, we have not done a test in out of plane. There would have to be some other test. So, so we run the program calibrated on the gap test and calculate the effect of sigma ZZ in the transverse direction. So its effect is also big. Actually, you see the strengthening uh, continues even farther. That is black compared to blue, all right? Uh, and uh, then it goes down. Now, uh, if you take uh, uh, the, uh, another, at another level, this is 0.9 stress, this is a zero is here. So it, uh, it has a very significant effect, but different. Uh, for characteristic lengths, also a big effect. There is a, if a transverse direction, at 0.4 uh, compression of the strength value uh, gives gives uh, similar strengthening. Then some of the later the softening, the weakening, I should say. And at 0.9 is also a different curve for comparison. The red one, uh, uh, this is for zero. This is for 0.9. This is for 0.4 strength level. Uh, now, why the microplane model works reasonably well? I have long believed in it. It's uh, being now used in national labs for defense calculations, projectiles, missiles, and such things with uh, tens of millions of final elements. Uh, the basic is that the it is easier to construct constitutive law because you deal, you could uh, you form the constitutive law in terms of vectors of strain and stress on planes of various orientations in the material. These are their components. So you can easily think of tensile cracking, what should be the rule for the Gaussian law intuitively. Uh, it's in, uh, quite intuitive, of course. What should be the rule for splitting, uh, you have, uh, compression, uh, which should be a frictional and slip and uh, latency. And uh, the microplanes are there organized theoretically in a, a random heterogeneous material. All possible orientations are equally valid. Uh, but we sample the special orientations by uh, according to an uh, integration scheme, Gaussian and a unit sphere. And the minimum number which gives good results, which is something accurate, is 21 microplanes per hemisphere. And they are normal to the radial rays through the points, uh, vertices and mid-sized points of the Verica Hedron, but we use actually more refined integration scheme. Uh, in microplane model, you start with uh, continuum strain or macro strain. Uh, instead of going by tensors uh, and invariance into continuum stress by constitutive law, uh, you go you project it into the, the, the by kinematic constraint into micro, uh, into various planes called microplanes. There's just a name. Uh, then you have constitutive law vectorial. You get micro stresses. Then by variational principle, 
which will work in this case, you get macro stress. Now it has advantages which are often overlooked. For example, that if you introduce compression and tension, the response is not elastic as predicted by all models which have just a few loading surfaces, but it's actually highly inelastic. This is uh, uh, compression loading and then introduce torsion and you see the enormous weakening of the material in going transversely, which tensor models give perfect. This is generally ignored, but it's, a, a, I think, a very important point for many applications. Now, uh, what about other materials? So we now are getting ready to test fiber concrete, shale, and textile composites. So fiber reinforced concrete, uh, these are predictions still. We take the model calibrated uh, for plain concrete. Uh, we have a model how to introduce effect of fiber slipping and uh, pull out and all this. And you see the difference is big. Of course, you start higher. Uh, you start here at zero parallel stress. At first, fibers prevent anything to happen, but then it's steep rise again, uh, similar uh, strengthening. And then it goes again down at uh, uh, large compressions. Uh, and of course, compression strength is higher. So that's why we end up here. Characteristic lengths for process, fracture process on size also increases fracture fiber reinforced concrete, then goes down. But that's computational prediction. Tests uh, will be made. Uh, they are, we actually are starting collaborations with UC Boulder, Mia Hubler, and they will probably go, uh, be going on soon. Uh, very interesting is shale for purpose of fracking. It's anisotropic material, which means the microplane model is generalized by combination with silicon microplane. You can get uh, easily anisotropic this way. And in fracking, uh, we generally uh, uh, do vertical cracks, uh, uh, not horizontal cracks, which are then normal to the bedding planes. So this is the case of interest for practice. So you see again, big in increase of the fract fracture energy and then decrease to zero. So with a big compression, if we can make it, we make the material crumble here. Uh, uh, process, uh, processes on size, uh, again, uh, with for the uh, normal to the uh, normal to the bedding, big increase, big decrease, uh, much less increase in power to fracking, but this, this is not used. Uh, all right, textile composites. Now, uh, again, we uh, are starting some tests, uh, uh, not yet going on. Uh, it was delayed by uh, uh, the pandemic, of course. So, for example, we used uh, uh, in a contract with Ford twill composites for crush cans. We have a model to predict the material properties from uh, in the way for a triad microplane model, which take into account buckling of the fibers and the waving. And the result of the calculation, and that's prediction, not tests, so it's speculative. Logarithm of size, logarithm of nominal strength. Uh, no south effect will be horizontal line, so it decreases. And you see when we increase the sigma x from zero from to 30 MPa, which is about half of the strength, we have a big shift. That shift seems small in this picture, but it's actually uh, is a log scale, right? So it's about doubling of the fracture energy. And then we expect for larger stresses to be decreased. So there is a significant effect. All right. Let me summarize now the main points for quasi-abital materials. So the crack parallel compression is proven experimentally and theoretically to almost double the uh, uh, fracture energy and reduce it to almost zero if it's, uh, if it's very big. Uh, it's similar for the width of the fracture process zone. Computation model must simulate a damage band uh, with some tensile softening law and line crack models, uh, uh, cohesive crack model, uh, uh, LEFM, including XFM, which is based on it, cannot do that. Uh, uh, we know that microbial model is a reasonable answer, perhaps could be improved. Now in part two, 
Uh, that's the new results uh, uh, obtained a few months ago uh, on plastic hardening metals. Now, it's a big subject, enormous subject studied intensely. And for the practical purposes, uh, it is understood adequately. But uh, the problems of uh, 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 scaling have not been addressed really uh, uh, in an analytical way. So I just briefly mentioned stress structure have was taken account by the uh, J, JQ concept, uh, the Q annulus around the crack tip. So they determine the effect of T stress uh, at, at one uh, size, uh, no side effect, hydrostatic stress parameters were introduced uh, in the a HR ha Hutchinson, Rice, Rosenthal, Rosenthal, which called HR field. Uh, also, it's a yielding zone. Uh, the, it was uh, clarified uh, related to the onset of void growth and cleavage fracture. Uh, the main contributors, uh, major contributions by Fong Shi, Hancock, Betagon, Hutchinson, Twergar, Needleman. All this happened late 1980s and 1990s. And please, there is also crack pass deflection phenomenon in LDFM uh, by T stress. Uh, uh, that's a different problem that the crack can deflect to the side and that I will not be discussing here. Now people did realize in metals that uh, uh, size has to be tested. So these are tests at uh, Westinghouse uh, of specimens going up to half meter size. And they basically verified that the small scale leading approach, the use of K1C, or fact, uh, linear acid fracture mechanic is valid for large enough specimens which matter for nuclear reactor structures. But apparently no law for the side effect has been attempted. Uh, if we could check it, if we had the data, but we don't have the precise data for this. Now, there is a, <laughs> metals seem similar because they have a much more simple microstructures than concrete, for example, or, or composites but they are actually more difficult because the yielding zone is inserted between the elastic zone, unloading and the process zone. It is very large. Uh, it is uh, process zone is uh, of the order of size of the width is probably uh, several microns because the crystals are about half micron size uh, of the metal. And that has to be taken account. So fracture is happening within the plastic region, not within elastic, but on the large scale application, of course, is this. Structure is much bigger than the yielding zone. So we need to distinguish three scaling domains. The, the, the regime is damage, where the specimen is theoretically smaller than the yielding zone. Uh, these are sub-millimeter specimens. Uh, the large scale yielding, when the yielding zone is not small compared to the specimen size, and small scale yielding. Now, I will show there are, uh, there are three asymptotic behaviors actually. Uh, we plot here logarithm of the size, logarithm of the nominal strength of the structure. These are the three behaviors. For just like in the quadrupedal materials, the initial asymptote damage must be horizontal. Uh, that's a micrometer scale. Uh, uh, this is a dim up to this dimension. And there's a transition, and there is an intermediate asymptote. That's a recent concept, a recent introduced in the 1970s by Barenblatt and uh, formulated rigorously, uh, uh, which is in the middle. And that spans three orders of magnitude, uh, up to about 50 millimeter size of the yielding zone. And then there is a transition to small scale yielding a large structure, which eventually goes to LEFM somewhere here. So we have to cope with these transitions. Now for analysis, uh, I, I take what Hutchinson and Rice introduced early on in 1968. Uh, they took Ramberg Osgood law and dropped out elastic part. Now. This is very helpful uh, for the near tip field, dropping the elastic part, because it creates a self similar field equation with the elastic part, it would not be. And if this field equation is self similar, 
and uh, if the structures and everything is uh, 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 similar, and if there is a wedge or uh, or, cra or crack uh, the geometry, the near singularity, you can show the uh, uh, field of uh, response must always be separated into an angular function times a radial power law. That's a general rule, not only for elasticity and plasticity of this kind, uh, uh, self-similar plasticity, but it's also the rule for electrostatics and for uh, um, hydrodynamics and uh, laminar flow and, uh, and many theories. Uh, so uh, the law must be self-similar and uh, uh, reality is there is a uh, elastic part which actually becomes negligible after large deformation. This becomes nearly vertical. So we model it like this, one power law. Uh, and uh, of course, when events uh, unloading occurs, that's after the uh, other process zone, then there will be unloading. Okay, so from uh, Hutchinson, Rice and Rosengrant, we have the needed stress fields which are parameterized by some characteristic of the yielding zone size, R is the radial distance, N is the hardening exponent uh, of, this, uh, of this law. And then there are angular functions uh, which have been tabulated and obtained very accurately by fine differences uh, uh, or conformal map mapping also at, at that time in 1968. And those are available, but uh, I don't write them because they're complicated. This is the yielding st strain, uh, yield, yield stress, yield stress size of process zone, and this is uh, a parameter, dimensionless parameter. Now, from this, using J integral invariance, you can show that the nominal strength in large scale yielding, this is this case, structure is not too large, not large enough, uh, complete yielding zone, and does not intersect with either. You have, must have this kind of scaling. Uh, D exponent inverse of one of n plus one. N is typically about 10 to 15, so it's a rather small slope, as I showed in the previous picture. Now, the problem is how to match the elastic field and the yielding zone. The, the boundary is complicated, uh, can have various shapes depending on the T stress and other. Uh, other situations, but we don't need the precise shape. We need effective size, something like this, like a circle. Why? Because uh, if we have error 50% of this radius doesn't matter because going from three orders of magnitude, from uh, three nanometers to 50 nanometers and then two orders of magnitude more. And uh, this is absolutely irrelevant what exactly the shape is. So on some radio ray radius, you have the elastic field, so the factor divided by square root of R, singularity, and then a weaker singularity, much weaker for the plasticity. This is here. And uh, one way to match it, it was done, of course. Uh, uh, Hutchinson matched them on a, uh, on a strip specimen with edge cracks, uh, matching the actual the displacements. But I want to propose a more general way of matching uh, by energy-based, namely we imagine a circle with a radius higher than this RP, RP prime, such that the area uh, which is uh, in the, uh, where the yielding zone is, is less, is equal to the area where the elastic zone is smaller. Uh, so this is a, a circle within a, an annulus, and the ratio is exactly square root of two ratio. And we require that in this ratio, the uh, gives the energy of the mismatch, if we imagine some elastic resistance is minimized. It is actually equivalent to uh, as, uh, taking a virtual work principle and uh, uh, as, uh, the uniform uh, strain field parallel to the crack and uh, uh, the virtual work of, uh, of these stresses uh, uh, must be equal for both cases of this variation. Gives exactly the same result. The uh, result is a general formula, which is similar to what was obtained by Hutchinson, except for 
uh, for multiplication constant. Uh, characteristic lengths, uh, LEFM characteristic lengths, Irwin's lengths. One, uh, some constant here uh, uh, of the order of one. One minus another dimensionless constant T. This is the correct parallel tension or compression and yield strength. So this is the general rule for the for, for this. Uh, uh, actually, this calculation can be also applied for enormous uh, stresses in different directions. Okay, so it, it's a more general approach. Now, uh, what is the scaling or side effect at correct parallel stress here? So we need analytical formulas and I'll pursue a similar approach we use for quasi-bital materials. So in quasi-bital material, we divide the energy release into energy release uh, from, the, uh, from the zone where the crack propagates, the, from the uh, energy release from the uh, wake or from the, the trail of the fracture process zone. Uh, and uh, uh, this is this width of the fracture process zone in LEFM. And then there is another term, uh, which is uh, basically can be imagined if you advance a crack uh, released from the additional area uh, where uh, you suffer unloading, elastic unloading. Uh, of course, this is intuitive, but it can be shown that in the limit, asymptotic limit of infinite size, this term is exactly proportional to D. So that's where the asymptotic matching comes again. This is uh, accurate only for very large size, and this is accurate for very, very small size. So there is almost uh, all the elements, uh, all the structures uh, damaging. Now, similarly, in the HRR theory, uh, I propose we have here uh, uh, energy release rate from the, uh, from the structure, same as here. Uh, uh, which is uh, going to infinite size accurate. And instead of the width of the damage zone, we must use a radius of the yielding zone, where uh, a tiny point, uh, area in this is the damage zone actually, RP. And so it means that when we, he with the fracture process is a, uh, near, uh, very small here, this is the yielding zone, effective. And when it moves forward, it releases energy, uh, from uh, from the width of this band, which was there before uh, before a fracture here in front, for example, and then uh, uh, we again release energy from the structure as a whole, and uh, asymptotically it's proportional to d. Okay, then, so we have this left hand side. Now uh, we have uh, energy. On the right hand side, which is dissipated, is of course the fracture energy of the process zone, but we must add, unlike quasi-bital materials, energy dissipated in the yieldings, by the yielding. Now, please, no energy is dissipated actually in the yielding zone. Uh, uh, J integral tells us uh, that uh, uh, for any contour, the same flux, so energy is dissipated there. It is dissipated behind the yielding zone when it passes a certain station and then this area gets unloaded. So imagining uh, a slip of this by two RP, the diameter, all this energy is unloaded here and that gives the rate of energy release. So uh, it comes here, this is the energy release rate, plus in the wake of the yielding zone, not in the yielding, but in the wake, it is yield strength, yield strain, radius proximal so which is dependent strongly on the T-stress and then there is a parameter which we can calculate exactly from the radial distribution functions of Hutchinson and Rice. Okay, so we have this equation and uh, then uh, it goes to a, a formula which surprisingly is the same uh, as it is for quasi materials, size effect law again. Uh, D0, transitional size and uh, uh, so, uh, strengths for zero size theoretically, uh, but the parameters are expressed differently. So this uh, D zero is now parameterized not to width of the process zone, but to the yielding zone. We have again LEFM function here. That's very advantageous for calculation of uh, evaluating fracture energy. And for this uh, zero size strength, sigma zero, we have, I guess, similar expression, but we have RP, 
plastic zone, and we have additional term, which is uh, uh, proportional to yield strength, yield stress, uh, elastic modulus, and this can be calculated exactly from the angular uh, variation functions of uh, uh, Rice, Hutchinson, and Rosengrant. Now, of course, this can be reduced to linear regression, so we can get RP, we can get sigma P, and then we can get fracture energy, but please, we cannot get individually from this. We get some of fracture energy dissipated in the wake of the yielding zone, in the fracture process zone, but from our calculations, we find this may be only a tiny fraction, a few percent, maybe even one percent of the total. Uh, but there is a way also to determine by different kind of tests. So uh, this basically tell, tells us scaling in the small scale reading here relative to the aggregate of the whole thing, which ends up with here. So it is really from this asymptote to that one, but ignoring the asymptote for the uh, uh, in the middle. Now, if I add uh, consider our large scale reading, which happens in a small uh, small small specimens, uh, large scale HRR field. Uh, then we have to take into account this asymptote, and that's when we do testing not here or predictive applications not here, but in the transitional range. So then this must be included, and if we include it, we have a uh, we must replace this RP by uh, by this expression, which corresponds to this uh, uh, large scale leading as as a scaling. Uh, uh, rho is a relative uh, radial distance and uh, this can be reduced to a simple equation but unfortunately not linear regression it's a non-linear equation uh, which is just these parameters but it is easily solved numerically instantaneous or mathematical by minimization of the square of, uh, of this uh, or actually there is also approximate formula to solve this all right then uh, we have also we may wonder what is the scaling when you have a specimen smaller than the yielding zone. So we would need a different equipment, of course, because this specimen would be less than a millimeter size. Uh, it can be done, of course. A fracture uh, specimen is, wants to be smaller than the yielding zone sign. And then the scaling law is this, transitional. This is one end is the horizontal and it goes from here to there, this, this part. Uh, and if we actually uh, can do these tests, we could separate this fracture energy dissipated by yielding zone and by the actual fracture process zone embedded inside. Now, we have done some tests in aluminum. Again, it's very much slowed down by pandemic. They are done by Don Mess now, who was a student at Northwestern, then a postdoc, then visiting scholar, and now is an associate professor at the Technical University of Istanbul. And he's now doing these tests there. So these are the aluminum specimens, similar, similar notches. Here the loading, uh, the gaps. Uh, and these are some results. Now, without the gaps, actually, we have done these tests 1987 in aluminum at Northwestern. And this was published uh, long ago, but we did, at the time, we didn't have a scaling theory for this. Uh, but anyway, if I interpret it today, it gives me uh, total fracture energy for no crack parallel stress, 112, and from J integral, uh, we get by, uh, we get 122, so it's within the uh, range of error. The J integral contours are here shown in the red, uh, using the uh, Needleman uh, uh, and, uh, method of conversion to uh, area integral based on uh, uh, integral theorems. Uh, so the large zones give very accurate results. These are too small for the element size that we use, so we scatter, but there is a reasonable agreement. If we plot it uh, uh, using the intermediate asymptote, we get results too, not too different. This is shown here. These are the old tests. Now, the new tests by Don Mess uh, done uh, two months ago uh, went into some small sizes which you must exclude because that goes to the intermediate range. These are uh, so the, 
but the other ones nicely follow the curve and uh, uh, they are when we use the overall uh, matching and when we include these tests, small square tests, we have the uh, formula with a different asymptote. So that's in progress. However, we have some results already with the gap with, uh, with for the aluminum, aluminum alloy. So this is a test that is running. Uh, this is a aluminum specimen. Uh, you see the gap. Now we need to have uh, supports against lateral buckling, which are at the end to prevent it. And uh, the specimen is not wide enough. And uh, for small load, we can do with the plastic pads, which we have well tried. So we have load only 15% of the yielding strength. But already you see a significant change in the scaling law. So a shift of the asymptote. And that's manifested in the renal regression plot using our formula. So there is a significant change of the fracture energy at 15% of yield strengths from 37 to 42. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not negligible and probably for, for larger loads, we have to use different pads. We're experimenting with other materials. Uh, uh, to produce uh, large loads to get perfect plastic plateau, of course. Uh, now it can be documented by simulations. We use for the simulations first by a Verbitsky model, uh, by uh, for the damage in this damage zone here, and then we switch, which is, gives better results. I think by Gurston Nidlma Twergar model. Uh, and you see the change uh, due to applying crack parallel stress significant, no, no parallel stress and with 40 percent yield strength, very different, a very big fracture process zone. Again, the effect seems to be larger metals, uh, but uh, still needs much more comparison, uh, check. All right, so the main point for metals, uh, as a summary, uh, the effective yielding zone is generally termed by minimizing the misfit energy or equivalently by virtual work equivalence rather than by point matching of the displacement. That's a general approach. For metallic structures with small scale yielding, which are much larger than a general field, the energy balance gives the same scaling law as collabital, same form, reducible to linear regression, but parameters are of course different, they express differently. Now, we need to take into energy release by unloading, not in the yielding zone, but in the wake of the yielding zone. And that's essential for energy balance. Uh, energy balance in a sense of, of scaling. Uh, dissipation of the yielding zone wake must be included, as I said. Uh, transitioning to the large scale yielding, uh, uh, which is, happens in small specimens, is non-linear, but also available. But I must emphasize much more expert verification will be necessary. This is, cannot be uh, uh, taken for granted yet that much more is needed. Now some consequences in a, so, uh, uh, in a few minutes uh, for practice of crack paralysis stresses matter. So one case I want to mention that's also how we go to this. Uh, fracking. Now, fracking cannot be done by linear elastic fracture mechanics. I think not even by cohesive crack model. We use crack band model where all these phenomena affect, automatically takes into account of effect of crack parallel compression, gives these effects. So we have here a horizontal cross section of a shale layer which has pre-existing uh, natural cracks, but they have been closed totally as we showed by millions of years of creep. And there, what only remains is damage. So these are zones of damage, which have different bio coefficient. It's poromechanics, okay? Uh, this is the main primary crack uh, or, or the zone of injection because the injection at three points here uh, and uh, they open the crack and then the, 
uh, fracturing propagates. This is not how they picture the oil industry now. They think these are individual cracks, which is impossible, far away. And and there is branching. Now, interesting from the crack perspective is this. Initially, when you put pressure, you have this uh, an opening. You have, of course, the same stress as before, basically. So it's a hydrostatic stress in the horizontal plane. But that's pyromechanics. Uh, that means that pressure is transmitted by diffusion. It moves inward. And eventually, instead of compression on the total material, porous, it is transferred into the solid. Uh, solid only and fluid has no pressure parallel to the crack. So you have crack parallel stress and that, of course, we know can cause uh, uh, even uh, weakening of the fracture energy at the beginning uh, increase and crushing. And that probably is a big part of the success of fracking. And the second part is that this is a band, not, not a line crack. Uh, now, another problem, a formidable problem of fracture mechanics is the shear fractures in reinforced concrete. For example, in shear of reinforced beam, this is a beam which is uh, only the left side of it is shown. Uh, it is uh, loaded by a concentrated load. Here is the reaction. So this is a shear zone. Uh, that problem has been studied for 100 years by fracture mechanics for 40 years and nobody could model it with the LEFM or Koizekary model. But it has been modeled with Craigman model. And th the reason is this, uh, because it's tensorial. What happens is, uh, well, okay, this is documented by experiments. Experiments were done by Teichmann and Corol in uh, uh, recently, three different sizes uh, plotted in scaled coordinates, in dimensionless coordinates, they give same cracks, shape, that's important for different structure sizes. So it, it is, happens uh, in reinforced concrete, typically cracks grow similar at different sizes. Maximum load is achieved at this point. Uh, and this is uh, in the post, uh, post peak response. Uh, now uh, crack starts growing at the bottom, either here or in the middle, and it wants to grow as a mode one crack under the shear field. So here LEFM could be can be applied or cohesive crack model. But when you go high, compression actually reaches the level of compression failure. And there is there is a high crack power compression, which really is expressed by the strategy time model, an intuitive approach, which actually is very correct. And uh, so here you have really zero fracture uh, fracture energy, zero stress is a factor. It's purely compression failure. Uh, that governs the side effect. So that's the only way to model it uh, logically. Uh, and it is confirmed by the, by the gap test why this is happening. Another point I want to mention in composites, highly orthotropic, for example, unidirectional laminate. Uh, you can create a transverse notch in a tangent specimen and uh, if it is high it does not go forward, go sideways crack. And that crack cannot be predicted by a line crack model. It can be predicted, uh, can be uh, simulated. If you assume there is a potential crack as Fleck has done already, uh, uh, potential crack. And then of course you get that it opens this one rather than that one, but you, on the other hand, tensorial model tells you the, where it propagates and whether it starts here or later. Actually, it, it uh, conclusion is it must grow a certain length, exactly certain lengths, and then it goes out way. Uh, uh, so, uh, and degree of orthotropy matters, of course, and that requires a tensorial damage approach for composites. Otherwise, uh, and that's actually typical in practice. Uh, uh, in these materials that uh, we need to decide which, which propagation occurs. So large crack parallel stress often matters. I already mentioned shear cracks in reinforced concrete, same for precess concrete, where you automatically have compression prior to crack, large ones. Uh, of course, longitudinal cracks in pressurized aircraft fuselage, which are bioaxial tension, K 
casing in a solid fuel rocket, which is tension compression. She cracks in aircraft wing, rather stabilizer, big concern, and there are biaxial tension compression. Fracking already discussed, and paramechanics is a uh, major consideration there. Sea ice sheets, obviously, pushing on a fixed oil platform, for example. Uh, pressure vessel failures. Crash cans for automobiles, they dynamics, but uh, the tensile model is necessary. You cannot use line crack model uh, because of this per crack parallel effect. Uh, is big there. Cracks in uh, caused by projectile impact requires that. Cracks in inflatable shelves. Most thermal cracks have multi axial stresses in the crack zone. In the geology, many examples in earthquakes, seismic effects, so forth. So there is a large number of applications where the crack parallel stresses are not negligible and where they matter. So with this uh, as an afterthought, Many hot research subjects become close in a few decades, but like turbulence, fracture mechanics is different. This formidable subject has been researched for a century and probably will for another century. All right, and finally, acknowledgement. I had great collaborators. I already mentioned Abdullah Dönmez, associate professor in Istanbul, Hoang Guyen, uh, uh, near his doctorate at Northwestern, a doctoral student. He did um, mo most of the computation, uh, actually all of the com numerical computations and helped very much in the analytics too. You will you, a, 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 a beginning graduate student who already worked on uh, simulations for the composites, which I showed, Dat Ha, who is uh, a finishing MS student, uh, uh, moving in the fall to MIT uh, for graduate study, but still doing work on this damage mechanics. There was a simulation uh, in the metal. Uh, he used the uh, uh, model of, uh, of uh, Needleman uh, uh, and also the model of Yerzbitz can buy. Then Holy Shoe beginning graduate student uh, also working on the composites, Dan Yang To also graduates in composites. And finally, my, and uh, uh, importantly, my distinguished, respected colleague, Gianluca Kusatis. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Bazant, for uh, the wonderful uh, uh, seminar. So, um, the uh, seminar uh, is open for questions. We have questions um, online, but before uh, um, we start with the question online, reading them, I would like to give uh, the opportunity to all our panelists, the one they appear here on the screen, to ask or say something to Professor Bazant. So, uh, who uh, wish to ask, please, is your time. Okay. Yes, uh, Professor Schreffler. Hello, it was a very stimulating talk. Now at the end you mentioned that uh, examples from geology. Now uh, we are lately looking into crack uh, forerunning in geophysics for earthquakes. So I wonder what would be the effect of large par stresses parallel to the crack on forerunning? Because this you know is a very good question actually. And surely there is an effect. So of course, uh, we know that the, the crack uh, sliding zone is very narrow. It's sub-millimeter. Yeah. But at front, there is somewhere at front. At front is obviously wide. Uh, and it's only behind the frontier crisis. And that at the front, which is what matters for running of the crack, of course, yes. there must be effect of crack power stress, and this is a mode two crack. So that makes it very interesting, of course. We haven't studied mode two, except that uh, uh, some tests indicate it's important. Uh, I could actually show if I would share again my screen. Uh, share. I, I would like, wait a minute. 
I have some reserve slides here. You see, these are tests in mode two, done long ago, not analyzed yet. And if you put a axial force and torsion, you get a cone. If you have no axial force, you get a transverse crack. So there is a big crack parallel compression, but also what complicates it, there is also friction. We believe that crack part for compression is significant. We have not analyzed it. That was done in 1980s at Northwestern, uh, this test, uh, published 1990. So I would say if I go back, uh, let me unshare this, uh, stop share. So I would infer that in mode two, there would be an effect too, and it needs to be studied. Okay, you just pointed out a very important direction for the future. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your last slide was very inspiring. I mean, they have still to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> we you. know there is an effect, <laughs> even with mode two. <laughs> yeah. And we know that mode two can happen in concrete and in uh, geomaterials. Earthquake is an example, of course, but in concrete, it's doubted, but no, it happens too. Yeah, also the echelon which you get in, in geophysics. Is oh, yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So you are you are you are on a very good problem path. <laughs> very important direction. I'll be I'll be very curious what you get. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much for this question, Gianni. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bazan. Very interesting and stimulating seminar. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, with uh, my colleague, Dr. Gabriele Pisano and uh, CNR, we have done a lot of testing during the last months uh, on glass. Glass is a brittle material par excellence. And uh, we are using probabilistic uh, fracture mechanics and uh, uh, some generalized Bible statistics to interpret the results, and especially the scaling, which is associated with the size and the type of stress in the material. And uh, we found a result that does not square with a classical approach relying on Bible distribution. And uh, actually a possible explanation for this and we are presently working on that, is the effect of a T-stress. That seems to be the- What kind of stress? The T-stress. Of fatigue, yes, okay. The T-stress seems to be very, very important to interpret some results that otherwise could not be interpreted with a classical approach. And to my knowledge, uh, there is a very little work on T-stress for brittle materials like uh, glass. And uh, the, this effect, especially from a probabilistic uh, point of view, and uh, a, a possible explanation that might be uh, related to what you had just tell us is that also in glass, even if it is considered a very brittle material, there is some process zone, even if uh, it is very, very small compared to other quasi brittle materials, but there is uh, some process zone. And uh, I was very interested in this discussion because probably in order to interpret uh, the scaling that we found in uh, glass, we should account for this T stress, which is usually neglected uh, in the traditional approach. It's just a comment. Yeah, there was a very, very useful comment. So for probability is very important. And the distribution is two. Actually, we show that for the same mean strengths, you can have a difference at probability tail, which matters, one in a million. Yes. yes. Uh, of 50%. So optimizing actually for the mean is not necessarily useful. But uh, you mentioned why we I fully agree. It's not applicable for generally for quasi materials and glass uh, depends on scale, probably not also. Uh, we studied that actually a lot the last uh, 20 years. And uh, I 
published to his uh, book. Uh, yes, the tail is not, it's probably affected, it may be affected by carpal stress, but I think the main reason it is different is uh, in atomistic mechanics. Because the tail, a uh, Weibull tail has a, uh, uh, the Weibull tail is probabilistic. Uh, Weibull tail is pow a power law. And that's actually derived, uh, for, can be derived from uh, uh, activation energy theory, more precisely, uh, Kramer's rule of uh, uh, the traditional, traditional uh, uh, phase transitions. But uh, uh, at large size, you always have some color coupling and it goes to Gaussian. And we have a, we published a model some times ago, but in different field, not dealing with glass, uh, that it's, uh, the uh, model should be like Ga Gauss Weibull distribution, which changes with the size. So we mainly, mainly Weibull for very small size, but non-Gaussian for larger size, uh, not non Weibullian for Gaussian, going to Gaussian. And if there are, uh, not only uh, not only chain model if uh, uh, crack per, if uh, connections intervene which are uh, uh, parallel connections instead of series connections then it can go to something else called Fichtner statistics. So you hit an important question and I I agree with you that the crack process may have some effect there but it's not only that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, who wants to be next? Because I see so many uh, raised hands. Okay, Professor Ulm, please. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, and I'm very lucky to see Ustenek uh, still on uh, full force. I have two questions, uh, short ones, but important ones for me to understand. My first question is, um, how does the gap test look if you had a perfectly homogeneous material, perfectly homogeneous uh, material, that's my first question. What result would you expect according to your analysis? Perfectly homogeneous. Uh, yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Perfectly homogeneous uh, without yielding or with yielding? Well, yielding, I mean, without yielding with the power. Uh, so, wait, yeah, just a second. So, if you, had, if you had power yielding, if, if you have power yielding, right? So, huge effect. Now, without yielding, uh, all right. So, in perfect homogeneous materials, if you accept process zone is a point, uh, uh, that would be no effect, but it's never a point because fracture energy is always orders of magnitude bigger, even in glass, than surface okay. energy. So okay, so and if there is a width, there must be effect of fracture uh, of crack parallel stress, and it will be basically. Yeah. I mean, any would be the yeah. same. Yeah, but, but which which basically implies, I mean, let's say there's nothing like a, a heterogeneous material even at at atomic scale, right? So so uh, uh, this is one point. But now comes then related to this question, so it intimately relate to the heterogeneous, some heterogeneity. Uh, uh, of the material which affects the process zone, even in plasticity of metals, because there are grain boundaries, which explains the power scaling, right? But here's the question. Now, you you end up with a, an expression of the, an effective uh, uh, fracture energy, which is a, pro, uh, a sum of two terms. And actually already since, uh, I think since uh, the early beginning, people always wrote that uh, the effective fracture energy is a sum of it. But does that not implicitly state that the process which happens, which is related to fracture, which you call sort of the LEFM uh, asymptotic behavior, and the processes which take place in the uh, process zone are completely uncorrelated, statistically uncorrelated? Because if there were any correlation in between like that, what the previous question was asked of classes like raising, they should be coupled, so it would not allow for uh, uh, an, an additive form. 
So does that not imply this exactly? Would you, if you still adapt a, a, a additive form of, uh, you call it GS and GP? Well, it may not be exactly additive, but because they may influence each other, but I think additivity is a good, a good approximation. You need macromechanical models. You are champion of that. So <laughs> uh, it has to be studied uh, uh, on the nanomechanical level. Uh, so uh, you speak probably not of metal, right? There is a yielding. So uh, there is not much. Uh, it could be studied for polysilicon, simple material. There is a strong side effect there. And maybe polysilicon mm -hmm. is exactly the example. There is not much yielding there. So that's uh, the case where the process on uh, matters. And uh, John like tested that without correct power stress showed big effects, but um, it should be done also with correct power stress. I, I think there would be effect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a, it's a much work in the, for the future. Yes. Oh, thank you again. Um, okay, Professor Majorana, please. Yes, uh, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I should like to ask uh, uh, if there is a connection uh, with the high temperature problems, especially for concrete, because uh, in all your lecture, we have uh, heard about isothermal conditions. So thinking to the case where high temperature is important in concrete in particular, so, uh, have you thought also to this uh, particular application in the case of high temperature in concrete? They are perfectly right. The effect is major. Eh. We, in fact, studied it in Planas and I analysis yeah. some years ago. Yeah. Structural energy uh, with, uh, uh, we have to distinguish dry concrete or. Yeah. Uh, or wet concrete, in wet concrete is enorm enormously down with increasing temperature. Yeah. We have data on that uh, yeah. for, wet, uh, for wet concrete also. Yeah. So uh, it's not included, but uh, I expect a big effect. Yeah. It needs to be calibrated. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could predict it with some theoretical models, but really we need to do tests at different temperatures. Okay. So well. if you do, uh, uh, for example, pre-test concrete text for Carogenic uh, liquefied natural gas that will be uh, very different from yeah. uh, from concrete for some yeah. vessels which are higher temperature. Uh, yes. So in this can be interesting for both uh, uh, slow rates or and uh, high rate. It will matter, but uh, if you change temperature, you have to consider also uh, uh, moisture content. Yeah. And uh, and diffusion and it's a uh, poro mechanics. So it's a, it's a complex question. Yeah, clear. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Luca Placidi, please. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I was really in interesting in, in, this, uh, in this work uh, and it was really uh, so I, 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 I have appreciated it. Just a few, uh, I just a uh, a, a comment I would like to, to ask. From a modeling point of view, uh, in, in your opinion, in, in order to predict the, the effect of this parallel stress, uh, you have mentioned that uh, on the microplane model is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is used with, um, with, good re with good results. Is it, in, in your opinion, uh, maybe su sufficient a continuum phase field model or higher order. What 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 do you think about this possibility? It's a very good question. Of course, Faith's model is a vogue now. It's a uh, and it's a good model. I think it's a very powerful approach. It is sculpted from physics, but physics has to be for scale fields. We have a complicated tensor fields, and with unloading. I think in principle is a good model, but the uh, material model which they embed in with one parameter C uh, controlling damage going continuously from one to zero to one when you go across the phase field. Uh, that's not adequate. Uh, that's, they can model with it uh, isolated cracks. Look, if you have one crack, you can model it 
using crack band, either using isotropic softening of Mazar, you can use it by uniaxial stress ray law, cohesive crack model, you can model it by J2 plasticity, all these work. But if you have more complicated situations, crack power stresses or general tensorial fields, if you have interacting cracks, no, they never show these cases. Uh, for example, uh, let them show the uh, subdivision of cracks are growing in parallel uh, in drying, right, or in cooling. So that's actually a tough problem to predict correctly because uh, whether they propagate straight or not, that depends very much on this field. Uh, if you have uh, general situations like uh, I didn't see crack uh, face field model modeling sheaf fracture of reinforced concrete, enormous problem by which caused many disasters. Uh, they cannot do that, in my opinion. They, you need something like microplane model embedded in the face field, in my, in my, in my but that uh, makes it, makes the approach much less appealing because then, of course, you don't have the single parameter C, makes it very complicated. So in principle, the area is great. It's partly similar to the by model, but Craigman model has many parameters, of course. Uh, now, uh, we are working on a Craigman model, firm is doing it, which would be like XFAM running through the mesh arbitrarily. That may be, might be a better answer. All right, Thank so you. great potential, but great questions and big doubts. <laughs> so far, what has been shown is very limited. <laughs> so we will work on it to see. Okay, maybe you solve it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. The next one, uh, Barchiesi, please. Hello, thanks for this uh, very nice talk. But well, actually, I have only one question that is, uh, let's say, related to the previous question done by Luca Placidi. So uh, you derive in close form the, the, the processing zone, the radius of the processing zone that you called RP. And to do this, you need to identify some parameters that appear in your uh, scaling laws. So my question is, do you have any idea how the gap test can be, let's say, generalized to derive in more, in a wider class of situations, the parameters you need to get the, the correct parameters for your scaling law? Yeah, it's a tough question. Now we, already have a way to generalize the gap test to tension. That's not difficult. You just uh, uh, reverse the loading and uh, plastic tank uh, pads will be glued and in tension. Now in transverse, you have to use a different approach. Maybe you have to use additional actuators. They need some, they cannot be easily accommodated. I don't know, you can use uh, maybe wedge, but wedge splitting is not a good test because the uh, field is not uniform uh, of the stress. And whether we can get some simple tests which are unambiguous in interpretation for these other situations is, is hard. Uh, yes, we are thinking about it, we have some ideas, but I don't want to venture with ideas which may prove wrong. <laughs> Obviously, maybe you have some better luck in finding how to do it, for example, for mode two. That's uh, a simple test. How to do it for transverse compression. How to do it for shear in the crack plane. Mode one, but shear in the crack plane. It also has effect. Uh, such situations also uh, develop. I don't know, we, uh, <laughs> that's why fracture mechanics will be studied another hundred years. <laughs> and uh, just another related question especially to what was said before. So at a certain point, you showed us a slide where you have uh, an anisotropic material and you argue that when you have an anisotropic material, you will never see as we usually see in monodimensional crack models, crack going straight, but you will see crack going right, left and right or uh, yes, transversally to the initial uh, crack. I mean. So actually, uh, you, you also say that we need a tensorial description of damage to catch this effect. And uh, this uh, is possible, for example, in continuum damage mechanics, where you can have that damage is indeed a tensor, 
so that you can uh, replicate this effect even for simple crafts. So my question is, do you envisage the, the use of non-local modeling, even uh, not face field, to, to catch the behaviors that the gap test is, uh, let's say, unbading? Yes, uh, cosmic modeling, I didn't speak about it, of course, is a more powerful, in principle, more general approach. It is actually also used in some uh, uh, some general purpose codes like OFM in Prague, it's embedded. Uh, and uh, it uses, uh, yeah, you would say continuum image mechanics, uh, made it is actually, it's installed with tensor models. You, you can also use non-local uh, as, as we do with, uh, with microplane model. You say continuum image mechanics, in the narrow sense, it is one minus omega in the denominator to get stress, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Omega is, Again, in one parameter is not sufficient. It's sufficient for one crack, isolated. Uh, I consider uh, micro model to be control damage mechanics. Uh, uh, the model of uh, Grassel, uh, uh, tensile model for damage is control damage mechanics too. It's not based on one minus omega, it's more general. One minus omega, very useful complex for simple situations, but it's not general. That's uh, uh, so uh, yes, so there is lots of room to improve and continue the mechanics, if you want to say that way, that's what we need. Yes. Okay. Thanks for answering and this nice presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, some other of the panelists would like to ask a question. Then we have a lot of questions on the chat. Uh, Fabrizio, I think. Uh, Marco, if it is okay, uh... Uh, or oh Anil, please yes uh, uh, well uh, th thank you again I, I uh, so then I want to uh, congratulate you and thank you for a very nice presentation particularly for pointing to the inadequacies of uh, many approaches that we use for describing fracture including lefm xfem etc right and uh, for pointing to the fact that you need something that describes finite width, like a uh, crack band model, or ten and ten including tensorial fracture process zones, right? So uh, if I can be a bit provo provocative here, uh, would you say that a theoretical construct of continuum mechanics that we use at the moment, right, the classical continuum mechanics, that has no uh, way of describing length scales that are associated with what we call micro mechano morphological aspects, right? So, uh, will always be futile. I mean, any uh, progress in this direction is not going to achieve what you are hoping to achieve, be able to describe all the different situations and yeah, this is... should we completely abandon this approach and look at uh, some other way, uh, which were say recognized early in the development of uh, continuum mechanics, such as those of uh, Kosura brothers, uh, micropolar approaches or Mindlin's approach, uh, which include some aspect of microstructure within the continuum approach? Well, it's, uh, these are actually deeply philosophical questions. Uh, I believe that continuum mechanics is valid. Now, as I showed in 1976, it must have a characteristic length. Uh, and that length has nothing to do with microstructure. It's a fracture, fracture characteristics. It is not the characteristic length of Co in Cosera and Erigen and these models. It has to do with softening, localization. It's, uh, it has different values. So, if a heterogeneous material, okay, so uh, we showed and other people showed that if you have a lattice or big frame, frameworks, you can approximate a micropolar medium, which is an improved form of costara medium. But generally, uh, these approaches that have characteristic lengths are not exactly related to fracture. So 
have not been very successful. Uh, I mean, the, uh, these, uh, uh, for example, gradient models for were used initially for concrete and sand, and then they switched to second gradient, which is really closely related to uh, which gives Laplacian in the continuum formulation, second gradient. It was in 1990s. And uh, these perform much better. And they are directly related to the integral uh, uh, relationship, uh, actually can be derived from it, from the non-local integral type model. And uh, uh, so we, we need some way to introduce characteristic length. So the first gradients, I have some doubts because, okay, also, you know, in a symmetric specimen, they cancel out the only second grade. I believe more if gradients and second gradients, Laplacian, uh, if anisotropic. So, so, uh, just, uh, just a point of clarification. When you mean when you say first gradient, you mean first gradient of uh, displacement, or first gradient of placement, or first gradient no, no. or first second gradient. gradient. So, what, what is the meaning? Because there's some strain. first gradient of strain. First gradient of strain. Strain, strain, and the Laplacian of strain. Okay. The most successful model of that kind is, I think, uh, uh, the Bors, this Helmholtz equation. Okay, but uh, that's that's a valid approach. That's uh, the problem with these approaches when you have a continuum, the boundary conditions. What are the boundary conditions? Nobody came up with reasonable boundary conditions. Uh, with uh, gradient models, with integral type, yes. With integral type. Uh, uh, we can, uh, I think the right way is to isolate the boundary layer, which is simulated separately. And then the averaging length of integral type model never goes out of the boundary. And the boundary is treated like uh, in, in a lump way, that's just like in, okay, in boundary model of fluid mechanics, that's a similar thing. Okay. So, uh, yeah, in, in general, uh, I think we need to use continuum, but it has to be adopted in some way. It's characteristic length, but not only one. There are several characteristic lengths. Characteristic for heterogeneity. Irwin's length has nothing to do with heterogeneity, right? Uh, that's a fracture. And then uh, Irwin's length mainly gives the length. Uh, there is also width of the process zone. It's, it's uh, uh, related partially. It has been shown by Kusatis, for example, and Schauford, but not, not completely. Uh, all right. So, yeah, I mean, so it, it is clear the, the uh, characteristic length is not only a microstructural length, it is also associated with the I mean, heterogeneities can be of many types, geometrical, yeah, yeah. mechanical, now, length, uh, what, positional. Even length is a characteristic length. So it is a fracture energy divided by uh, material strength square, right? So where is the heterogeneity? And uh, that's valid also, okay? So there are more aspects to it, not just heterogeneity. Okay, well, I, I, the, 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 well, th thank you for answering my question. I, 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 it seems to me that a century already has passed since we started studying fracture mechanics, <laughs> and you are proposing another century. <laughs> so I am a little worried that we may never uh, solve or have enough uh, grasp of this problem to be able to say anything definitive. And well, I think we can important. say many things definitive. We can analyze structures. I think we can do many things very well with fracture mechanics, much more than 20 years ago, far more than 30 years or 50 years ago. There is a huge progress. But uh, new questions open up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Fabrizio, uh, if you want to say something, please. Marco, there are 19 questions, please. Leave okay, me. so I, I yeah. will, uh, uh, if there is no other question from the audience, I don't know uh, anybody wants to ask, otherwise I have 19 questions uh, on the chat that I have to answer, uh, to pose. Okay, so I'm moving to uh, those. Probably we will not be able to read them all, but the ones that will not be answered here, I will send to Professor Bazant 
and eventually we can answer by email later on because otherwise uh, we are going to be very late. So the first question, I'm moving really uh, uh, according to the uh, time when they have been posed, is from uh, Yushen Chen from uh, uh, the Czech Academy of Sciences. He says, greetings from Prague from the perspective of statistics. When we come to experiments, how many experiments do you need to repeat? Professor Bazan, please. Okay, so nice thing about size effect is that you need fewer experiments. To get a good mean value of strength for concrete, you need at least six specimens, but probably something like 20. Now, if you do uh, four sizes, then the regression itself uh, handles the statistics and uh, narrows the covariation as we know. The uncertainty in the regression goes down. So in, uh, actually in size effect testing, you have four sizes. It is in perfectly enough to use for concrete, which is a very scattered material, about three specimens per size, uh, which you could not do if you used test only one size. So that's, uh, I don't know if that's the point of the question. Uh, of course, you need fewer, fewer specimens for steel. It depends on the accuracy you want, of course, too. Uh, the typical scattering concrete is of the order of 8%, but we can manage with uh, special batches of concrete and uh, using one batch for casting specimen, 2%, but not better. For metals, for silicon, we can do far lower. Yeah, that's, that's a valid question and important for experimenters, of course, how much to test. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I move to the second question. Tao Xu, could the microplane model be effectively used to study the time-dependent deformation, damage and fracturing of rocks? Uh, yes, uh, I think I showed already one microplane model, which was, uh, works quite well for shale. It is based on microplane model M7. It was uh, extended at Western by Kurba Li, who is now in Chengdu. Uh, so that's one rock. We have some uh, microplane models for Indiana limestone. It varies uh, uh, for, uh, for Beria sandstone, approximate. But uh, there is it's a tedious work to develop a microplane model. It's a not. It's a. It's a combination of intuition, intuition and optimization, and, and insight. Uh, so these models have to be developed. I'm, I'm sure they can be developed for all kinds of rocks, including anisotropic. But uh, that's again another thing which requires some years to carry out. It's very much needed. Thank you. Uh... A question from Yusuf Haider, especially in lower scale fracture tests on heterogeneous materials, it's talking about micro or nanoscale, stepwise crack propagation uh, can be observed. He's talking about stepwise sigma epsilon curves in mode one fracture. Is it possible to reformulate the fracture critical energy to capture this effect in the continuum fracture model? Well, continuum fracture, of course, will always predict a continuous curve unless there are instabilities. Uh, I would like to point out that some of these jumps are often due to the stability aspects of the equipment. For example, if you have a rising curve and that rising curve goes little jump down and up and up and then down and up. Uh, if you have, if the slope of going down, equilibrium slope is less than the stiffness of the system, it is unstable, otherwise it can be stabilized. So for example, you see less jumping up and down if you instrument the the specimen at the crack tip or crack mouth, then if you control the load. Uh, on the control load, you see even going up many jumps and noise 
you see less noise and less jumps if you put crack tip gauge. Now in micromechanics, this is difficult to do, of course. Then you would need uh, gauges on the molecules, uh, on the size of the grains or uh, uh, so to, uh, that's partly to do with stability, but it is, uh, I still believe continuum model is valid in the middle, in the mean, and uh, uh, as a measure of the jumps, uh, or the scatter, you need a statistical model on top of that. Uh, but uh, if you, you use something like uh, the LDPA model of Cusatis lattice particle model, you can simulate it directly. Uh, that's probably the way to go for uh, actually the most reliable approach to damage uh, of, of all uh, of particle models, but with a very good uh, uh, constitutive loss on the particle interactions. Thank you. So um, I have uh, one question about history from Professor uh, Elishakov is asking, was Griffith the one who started fracture mechanics or there was somebody else, someone else before him? <laughs> yeah, there are, uh, 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 there's always somebody else. Exactly. <laughs> in, in statistics, in Valvo distribution, in uh, Buckingham theorem, uh, you name it. Always somebody else, but uh, Griffiths made the main contribution. For example, I think that Klein in Germany was earlier, but he uh, got the expansion, which is equivalent to Williams' expansion, but discarded the first term because he said that infinite stress is impossible. And then got a the solution without the first next singular term, which was wrong. Uh, so, but anyway, he had some uh, elements of fracture mechanics in it, which are vital. Uh, he got the uh, expansion actually, except that he didn't use it correctly. So there are always some people coming uh, coming earlier. Uh, Professor Elishako is a champion in understanding history of mechanics, and I'm sure he will he will he will resolve this and clarify. Thank you. So uh, I have a question from M. E. Kabali from Uppsala University. He say many thanks for the scaling law and idea for obtaining an effective plastic zone radius RP in a closed form. Is there an experimental procedure suggested for determining the unknown parameters eta capital T in this function? Well, one parameter is uh... Uh, that uh, dimensionless parameter IP is theoretical and is based on the angular field, which was already solved 1968, uh, distribution of the singular field as a function of the angle uh, uh, in 1968 by Hutchinson and by Rice. Now, uh, more, uh, for the other parameters, I believe the way to sort them out is by scaling, because, for example, uh, the fracture energy in the actual crack, which is of the micro size, scales different, it causes different scaling than the part of fracture energy associated with the yielding zone. And if we have, if we have, if we have tests also on the micrometer scale, uh, in addition to say on the large scale, we should be able to separate this out, not computationally but experimentally. So that's one aspect of the question I think that was asked. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Hongwei Zhu. He says, hi, Professor Bazant, a question about part one of your presentation. How we connect crack development and permeab permeability in concrete and rocks via dilatation. Can dilatation be an indicator for permeability change during loading or unloading? Thank you very much. Yes, the dilatancy or dilatation, if you prefer, has, uh, of course, effect on permeability. And in fact, in the modeling of fracking, 
we used uh, expansion in the process zone to add and modify permeability, but not only that, the bio coefficient also. Bio coefficient is uh, the effect of uh, uh, stress in the solid on the stress in the fluid, otherwise uh, fixed conditions in quantum mechanics. So my, my answer is yes, it is an effect has to be studied. Some of it is known, uh, some of it uh, is speculative comp computationally, but it needs, uh, needs more study, of course. A very good point, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have here a question from Morteza Nejati. Uh, probably we discuss a little bit more uh, about that before. However, he says, what could be the effects of crack parallel stresses on the shear fracture energy mode two and three? Any planned research on that subject? <laughs> we, we are quite busy with <laughs> <laughs> the effect of crack parallel normal stresses, uh, but uh, surely it is, uh, for mode two is very important. I, I showed that one one slide that. It uh, intervenes and uh, we have no plan at this time. And so, so if it goes ahead, it will have no competition from us at this time. <laughs> it's <laughs> very important though. <laughs> but maybe if some idea appears, we might get into it. I know it, it requires some good idea how to address it. it. It would have to be a different test. You cannot do gap tests for this kind of test, this kind of loading, crack power loading in mode three. Okay, thank you. So uh, Nagamani uh, Jaja Balila, does this crack parallel stress affect interface fracture energy measurements, especially in coatings or thin films when the coating is res residually stressed? Yeah, interface fracture is a more difficult subject. I, I probably, uh, he probably means by material interface, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it is never exactly sliding on a line. There is at least some damage on one side in the weaker material, maybe on both. And if there is some width, I would expect effect, but it has to be demonstrated. And maybe it could be simulated also. Uh, maybe it could be simulated by experiment. It's actually the best to do also with uh, friction, right? Uh, change from static friction to dynamic and all that. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a big a big subject. Uh, we have, I, I expect a significant effect, but uh, have no results. Thank you. So I'm reading now a long question from Noel Chalamel. He says, dear Professor Bazant, Thank you very much for your very interesting and exhaustive talk. You have worked since several decades now on non-local damage mechanics and non-local related theories. It seems that there are still some open questions, both on the source of non-linearity and on the nature of scale effects in these theories. I would be very interested by your point of view on those open questions. Would you connect discrete damage lattice mechanics, non-local damage mechanics, and cohesive damage mechanics? Um, could we fit similar uh, scale effects between these different theories? They deal with the same problem, so obviously correlate, uh, related. Non-local mechanics, cohesive fracture mechanics, uh, which is cohesive by definition, means on a line, can simulate the same effects except for the crack power stress. Now, damage mechanics and non-local mechanics, I believe to be one, because damage mechanics has to be non-local unless it is uh, fatigue in the hardening stage, then, then probably not. Uh, then you can avoid the non-locality. Uh, these are the early studies by Lameter and Kachanov. And, uh, I believe it is one field and they are surely connected. They should be considered as one. Non-locality, uh, just 
one type of origin probably there are many characteristic lengths so the, uh, it, it may be too limited uh, i think it's better to go with fracture mechanics and uh, with uh, with this lattice models lattice type lattice particle models which uh, can simulate the microstructure and they uh, involve all these effects but they don't give general laws generally interpretable laws and scaling Thank you. He's asking also at the end, in which direction would you recommend us to investigate significant, to sig investigate significant efforts for future studies in this field, connecting discrete and non-local continuous inelastic theories? Well, both which direction? Both analytically and experimentally, I would say. Yeah. There are many aspects to explore. Of course, there are many different discrete models that you can connect. Uh, I don't know. So it's a, it's a very general question. Uh, you have various discrete models, of course. Uh, you have the lattice particle models are not the only ones, but uh, there are many others around. And uh, they need to be connected. They have been so far connected by demonstrations, but uh, not really uh, in, a, in a general way. Okay. I will pose a, a last question because we are over now one hour of questions. Professor Bazant, my name is Ramesh. My question is, as, have you ever came across any material that showed reverse scaling effect? Well, not in fracture, but uh, scaling is actually more general. Uh, you have scaling uh, uh, of diffusion problems, of course. Uh, scaling in time. So, uh, as far as fail is concerned, uh, I have never seen an opposite effect that's strengthening by size. That's pr probably what he means. But yes, go, I think uh, something that's yeah, uh, becomes stronger fact, with big size. I think that looking at scaling for creep is a major consideration. It's the only way to give predictions for 100 years of creep of concrete, for example. Scaling in diffusion problems, drying, corrosion phenomena. Yeah, that's, uh, and they have all kinds of effects up and down, depending how you, uh, how you look at it, how you define it. But, uh, uh, but uh, probably the answer is also more discrete models. And we need good discrete models, uh, which are realistic. First of all, I have big doubts about peridynamics, for example, but for various reasons, which uh, have been published and ignored. But uh, I think for fracture models, which uh, consider particles and must have rotations of particles and slips and normal separation between particles are the way to go. And I consider best the LDPN model of Cusatis, but uh, uh, these are the questions would answer it. And, could you ever see reverse, uh, reverse side effect in these lattice particle models, general discrete models? Uh, I don't think has been seen, but uh, maybe I, I doubt there will be a surprise in this regard. Thank you. So we still have uh, half of the question uh, uh, that I will send you um, later on and eventually you can answer by email. I would uh, take uh, one minute to say that uh, if you are interested to meet Professor Bazant in person and listen in person to a presentation, you could come in uh, uh, June 2022 to Sardinia. We are organizing a, a wonderful conference in uh, uh, nonlinear solid mechanics, it will be in Alghero 13 to 16 June. Uh, Professor De Lisola and myself uh, uh, will be uh, very happy to welcome you there. And uh, 
If you are interested to organize a mini symposium there, please let, let me know or let Professor De Lisola know and we'll be happy to help you in this organization. So um, I thank very, very much Professor Bazan for uh, his time uh, and all of you for attending this very distinguished seminar. And uh, uh, I hope to see you uh, in person after the pandemic. So thank you, thank you very, very much and uh, hope to see all of you in person soon. Thank you. See you, Zanek. See Thanks you. for organizing this. Bye. See Thanks you soon. For the opportunity. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Zedenek. Thank you, Marco. Okay. Thank you, Glaucio. Thank you, Glaucio. Thank you very much. Great lecture, Zedenek. Great bye. lecture. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.